Uh, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to be talking about fetal arrhythmias and treatment. Uh, we'll start with the objectives. Uh, one, understand the epidemiology of fetal arrhythmia. Uh, next is to gain knowledge of uh, common fetal arrhythmia mechanisms, uh, followed by describing the treatment goals, and then uh, look at prognosis of these different types of arrhythmias in some more detail. So starting with the epidemiology, uh, we can't really talk about fetal heart rhythm disorders without talking about the conduction system itself, uh, which maturates uh, by 16 weeks gestation. So pretty early on in embryological life, you have essentially a fully functional electrical system. Uh, produces a regular rhythm, which is essentially a heart rate between 110 and 160, uh, pretty early on as well. And fetal arrhythmias are essentially defined as any perturbation in that. So whether your rhythm is irregular, uh, or whether the rate's abnormal, defined as less than one, 110 or greater than 160. Looking at the scope of the problem, the incidence of fetal tachyarrhythmias, where the heart rate's going fast, is about one in a thousand pregnancies. Uh, looking more at this in depth in terms of risk, uh, that being particularly high drops, is about is, is a little more than 50% in sustained arrhythmia, and about 20 to 45 percent risk of mortality in those patients, regardless of what treatment strategy is employed. So the prognosis here is pretty poor if these patients move on to develop high drops, which is an opportunity for intervention, of course, if we discover this early enough. <clears throat> Looking at arrhythmia distribution in this table here on the right, uh, there is a whole smattering of different types of arrhythmias and their rank in terms of uh, incidence. Uh, where premature atrial contractions that are seen at the top has the highest uh, prevalence at uh, a little bit more than 1,200 of the 1,300 fetuses in total that had arrhythmia, followed by supraventricular tachycardia, complete heart block, atrial flutter, uh, and then lesser degrees of heart block, second degree heart blocks, uh, sinus tachycardia, VT, atrial fibrillation, then rare things like junctional tachycardia and sinus bradycardia. Uh, just to be able to, for the non-electrophysiologists in the room, to be able to describe what these arrhythmia mechanisms mean, I think it's important to see this pictorially as somebody that is a visual learner like I am. Uh, the two reentrant types of arrhythmias that are very common in pediatric patients is this yellow guy here, which is a form of SVT called atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. The thing to know about this is that there is a pathway that's there that's not supposed to be there. That pathway, which I've highlighted with the green marker there, is a connection between the top and the bottom chambers that normally should not be there. And then what happens in older kids is something called AV energy, where there's a reentrant circuit within the AV node. And then there are things like flutter, uh, which is a macro reentrant circuit in the atrium. Again, we'll see this in a little bit more detail soon. Atrial fibrillation, atrial tachycardia, which are ectopic foci in the atrium. All these things can happen in, in the fetus, so some are more common than others. So we're going to focus really on the top four, uh, premature atrial contractions, SVT, heart block, and atrial flutter for the purposes of this talk, starting with what's most common. So PACs uh, are the most benign and the most common of all arrhythmias that we see, uh, typically not associated with congenital heart disease, so this occurs in babies that are otherwise normal. What the expectation is here is that resolution. The, these babies that have PACs, even if they have them after birth, they tend to go away by year one of age. So we largely ignore these depending on the burden. <clears throat> this is a um, an ENMO description. Dr. Ehrenberg may have shown you a slide similar to this before, where you take basically a dagger through uh, the ventricle and atrium. The atrium here is posterior, so the atrium is this back wall here, and here is the ventricle. And you see that the atrium contracts earlier than it's supposed to, and it conducts down the ventricle like it's supposed to. Uh, again, benign, uh, nothing really much to do about it. <clears throat> Let's move into the more uh, pathological type of arrhythmias. <clears throat> this is a, um, a study by uh, Haruj in 2008 circulation that looked at cross-sectional anatomy using uh, immunohistological staining of fetuses at various gestational ages. And what they found was that in a large majority of fetuses, as they're growing embryologically, <clears throat> there are little uh, muscular fibers that traverse the atrium and the ventricle, whereas normally in a fully developed heart, this 
annulus here. This is the tricuspid valve. That annulus would be electrically inert. Therefore, electricity cannot get through it. Though if you have a muscular fiber, fiber as a remnant embryologically that persists, that is essentially what an accessory pathway is, a muscle fiber that isn't normally supposed to be there. As this study showed, it's very common in, in younger babies, younger that you are, and the less embryologically developed you are, the more likely you are you have these muscle fibers that were spanning the atrium and the ventricle. Uh, <clears throat> what I tell our residents and fellows is <clears throat> the pizza pie analogy. So this is essentially thinking about this like a pizza pie. So you cut a pizza pie, you take the pizza, you remove it from the rest of the pie, and there are still strings of cheese attached from the slice to the pizza. That's essentially what a muscle fiber is and an accessory pathway is. <laughs> there are some chuckles here in the audience. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate the support. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> so this rhythm strip here shows um, a very common type of accessory pathway called Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. As many of you recognize here in the top rhythm strip, there is a delta wave, there's pre-excitation, a wide QRS, and then this patient goes into tachycardia. Looking at cartoons, and uh, though I'm a pediatrician, I still think of things like pediatric patients do in terms of cartoons. Uh, the electricity here goes down the AV node and up the accessory pathway. Remember that string of cheese analogy, that pathway here that exists, and this is a mechanism of tachycardia. We call this atrioventricular reentry tachycardia. <clears throat> this is what most people think of as SVT. So when we hear about SVT, this is what comes to mind, a narrow complex regular tachycardia, uh, very common in babies. So it's di diagnosed very simply <clears throat> by our OB colleagues. Um, they do fetal heart tones and they recognize that a baby's heart rate fast. Usually the common heart rate for uh, uh, for fetuses is about 220 to 260 for this type of arrhythmia. An M mode can diagnose the atrioventricular relationship, which is in a, sorry, in an obligatory fashion, one to one. That has to be the case. Uh, if I go back one slide, uh, these circuits are in parallel, meaning that the atrium has to activate, then the AV node, then the ventricle, then the pathway back up to the atrium. So if if there was not a one-to-one -one relationship, the tachycardia would terminate, can no longer sustain. The biggest question that we have diagnostically is whether there's high drops or not. So high drops, of course, is a sign that the baby's not compensating for this, uh, and a huge red flag, of course, for us uh, and for the OBs. Uh, moving on next to atrial flutter. So atrial flutter, I don't like the word SVT because SVT just means you have an arrhythmia that's not VT, so it's not very helpful for us as electrophysiologists. Atrial flutter is, in fact, a type of SVT, so moving away from the SVT nomenclature, I just like to call it what it is. So this is atrial flutter. We all recognize the sawtooth pattern here that we've learned about in medical school uh, that shows uh, incessant atrial activity that does not return to baseline. What this means, think about this in your brain, is that at any given time in the atrium, something is being activated. This circuit in the atrium causes atrial depolarization to be continuous so that there is no flat line in the ECG. Something is always being depolarizing, and that's why you see that sawtooth. Uh, these tend to be cavotricuspid isthmus dependent. This is important for us as EPs because this nice cute little corridor here is something that we can ablate and uh, terminate tachycardia in patients that are older. Uh, this is an example of an atrial macro reentrant circuit, which basically means it's a big circuit that involves lots of the atrium. That's what atrial flutter is. The atrial rates here are lightning fast, and a baby with real healthy myocardium that's not diseased, we tend to find atrial rates of 400 to 500 beats a minute. There are no arrhythmias in man that are this fast. Uh, only babies can do this. Only fetuses can do this. The ventricular rate is some... Uh, integral of that, whether it's uh, two to one or one to one, really depends on how fast the AV node is. And the ventricular rate oftentimes is conducted in a two to one fashion. So your atrial rate is twice that of your ventricular rate, and the ventricular rate usually is 200 to 220. This is so key because when we see what the ventricular rate is, we can distinguish atrial flutter from the cousin SVT uh, or atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia that we just saw, pathway mediated tachycardia, which tends to be a little bit faster. Uh, here, the ventricular rate slower because it's not conducting one-to-one. -one. Uh, again, the sawtooth pattern 
And this is often coincident with atrial dilation. So when we see atrial flutter, if an OB tells us there's atrial flutter in a patient, our first knee jerk is to say, well, is there also uh, atrial dilation and congenital heart disease as a uh, uh, coincident finding? Diagnosis, again, finding that heart rate between 200 and 220, and M mode, you're going to almost always see more A's than V's. So when you see more A's than V's, it tells you that the atrium is driving this arrhythmia independent of what the ventricle is doing. There is no relationship to the ventricle whatsoever. Uh, and again, we want to know about high drops. Associations of both SVT and flutter. Epstein's anomaly is a, is a great one since a tricuspid valve is not formed okay. You can imagine with an abnormal tricuspid valve that accessory pathways or strings of cheese can exist between the atrium and the ventricle in a valve that isn't formed appropriately. And of course, with a lot of TR, like you see in Epstein's anomaly, your RA is going to become humongous, and that can be get flutter. Uh, common AV, valve, AV uh, canal defects, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and tumors can all cause these types of arrhythmias. Treatment is really dependent. Whether you're term versus preterm, you have high drops or not, whether your tachycardia is intermittent versus incessant, whether your goal of therapy is rate versus rhythm control, oftentimes our goal in therapy isn't to make somebody go from an arrhythmia to sinus, but rather them go from an arrhythmia to a slower arrhythmia, because that can oftentimes allow them to compensate for that, uh, and sometimes it, the treatment can be worse than the disease. This is not meant to dissect. This is just for reference purposes. This looks at all of those criteria, whether you're term, preterm, how fast your rate is, what the arrhythmia is, and then algorithmically, all the various choices that we have in terms of treatment, whether it's uh, delivery, whether it's uh, uh, maternal uh, uh, medical therapy, and so on, and so on and so forth. Prognostically, in utero, mortality rates, if there is not high drops, is 0%. So if you have a baby that has SVT, it usually means that their SVT is not that big of a deal because they're compensating for it and they do okay. If you have a hydropic baby, it's a little bit different. Mortality is there, it creep up to 20%, and that obviously drives our hand to treat. Uh, pretty unlikely, though, if your heart rate's less than 220. Dr. Ehrenberg showed a number of about 200, 190. Either way, if your heart rate's lower, the probability of high drops is lower. Um, and high drops is obviously unlikely if your arrhythmia is intermittent. What about afterbirth? Uh, usually it's easier to control this arrhythmia, at least for us, right? It's easier, easier for us to control this arrhythmia when the baby's born because we can get to the baby, do things to the baby that we can't normally do otherwise unless you're Dr. Cass. Uh, and we follow the one-third, one-third, one-third rule for our babies. This is what we tell babies with SVT when they're born. There's a third of a chance that your baby will never have SVT again after a year a third of a chance that your baby will have SVT years down the line, and a third of the chance that your baby will just continue to have SVT. And we can deal with that after the baby's born pretty easily. Flutter prognosis is actually great if you don't have congenital heart disease. Uh, we consider this a one and done. Once a baby gets out of flutter after they're born, we usually don't even institute therapy, and baby lives normal life. Uh, with congenital heart disease, it depends on what the congenital heart disease is, how bad the atrial dilation is, so on and so forth. It's a little bit more variable. Uh, we'll move on to Brady, uh, Brady arrhythmias in, in the fetus. This is an example of complete heart block where you have sinus rhythm in the atrium, though no conduction down to the ventricle, and the ventricle is doing its own thing. That is the definition of complete heart block. Uh, again, dissociation between the atrium and the ventricle, the atrial rate, the sinus rate is totally normal, typically, uh, and the ventricular rate is dependent on what the ventricular escape rhythm is, which is usually between 50 and 80. Common associations, L transposition, heterotaxy of the left atrial isomerism type, which carries, a, a, unfortunately, a really high risk of high drops. Heterotaxy patients with complex congenital heart disease and, and high drops have a dismal prognosis in fetal life. Uh, and this is just a picture of, for reference of what left atrial isomerism is for the non-cardiologists. Uh, associations in a baby with a heart that's normal, uh, which is about 50, about 50 percent of all babies that have heart block, it's due to maternal antibody exposure. I think I skipped the slide, sorry. No, I didn't. Um, it's due to maternal antibody exposure, the anti-rho, anti-la that we all know about. Uh, there can be um, uh, fetal myocarditis as a, as a picture of this, and, and high drops can be implicit. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, antibody exposure and heart block in babies uh, 
um, is pretty rare before 18 weeks and then rare to develop after 28 weeks. So there's this sweet spot where patients with uh, antibody exposure are more likely to have problems with this. Usually though, it's idiopathic and we uh, don't end up finding what the reason is. Treatment for heart block really depends, just like for SVT, depends on whether you're preterm or full term, whether you have high drops. Evidence here is really weak. There's not great evidence that anything really does much to babies that have heart block. For example, if you see a baby with first or second degree heart block, uh, there hasn't been great evidence to show that you can abort the progression of that. Um, and steroids have been used. This is our friend Arnold. Uh, steroids have been used almost universally for this, though the data that it helps is actually quite low. Though in a hydropic patient that you think might have myocarditis, uh, steroids has a role in reducing the inflammation. Uh, there has been a study recently published in Jack looking at hydroxychloroquine to prevent uh, heart block in fetuses of uh, rho, anti rho anti la positive mothers. So just to provide the background, if you've had a pregnancy uh, that, I'm sorry, if you have maternal antibody exposure, the risk of a first pregnancy having heart block is 2%. Subsequent pregnancies is 18%. So this study looked at uh, mothers that have already had a baby with complete heart block. They treated them with hydroxychloroquine and they looked at the results and they found that they decreased the re recurrence rate by more than 50%. So they took the recurrence rate from 18% to a little less than 9% with this study. Maybe Donald Trump was right. Hydroxychloroquine, just kidding, just kidding. Yeah, there's everything. Uh, so key takeaways, premature contractions are benign. Prognosis is typically benign. SVT is the most common fetal tachyarrhythmia. Treatment consists of rhythm versus rate control. Really depends on risk factors that drives our treatment strategy. And fetal heart block is associated with congenital heart disease and maternal antibodies. And then this is again, just a reference for uh, those of you looking at this at home in more detail. That's all, thank you.